Raging Cajuns podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Wilson, alongside a very special guest, a man who's very busy, who's uh, been through a lot like most of us here in the country, uh, the commissioner of the Sunbelt Conference, the Keith Gill. How are you, man? Oh, I'm doing great, Kevin. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Where are you hiding out at right now? You know what? I'm at home, you know, so just trying to follow the um, stay-at-home order we have here in Louisiana and certainly know that you know, things are supposed to peak here either this week or next. So, um, yeah, just trying to stay safe and, and um, hide from the virus. For sure. Um, married kids? What's your, what's your family situation like? Yeah, so I've got a partner, Tiffany. Uh, no kids. So we met at Duke um, at a bus stop probably, what, 1991? Oh, what a later. good year. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so we've been together, um, yeah, for, for quite some time. So, yeah, she's, she's wonderful. And, um yeah, and so we are enjoying New Orleans. Love Louisiana. So really, I mean, the humidity is not my favorite. But um, other than that, <laughs> it is unbelievable place. Great people, great food, um, and for the most part, you know, great weather. Well, if you're, you're comparing the, the heat to, you know, the beautiful weather in North Carolina, that's a, I mean, that's not even fair, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, North Carolina is great. And I grew up in Florida, so okay. I'm used to some humidity. Although it's more humid here in New Orleans than than it was in Florida. I mean, I tell my brother all the time, I'm like, you guys got it easy in Florida. Yeah, it yeah. is. Um, it's special here in the summer. When the summer hits, it's um, it's pretty special. But what, we, we've enjoyed living here. What part of Florida? I'm from Orlando. Yeah, okay. so went to Winter Park High School. Uh, my dad was in the Navy, so he got stationed there um, at, at the Navy base. So we live right outside the gates. So I kind of grew up on a Navy base. Um, used to go there, get my hair cut, play hoops, work out. Um, and, um, and then he ended up getting, um, retiring and then he was a post office. Uh, he was a letter carrier for, uh, 43 years after he retired from the Navy. So my brother and sister moved around a little bit, um, with him and then, I, but I didn't because, um, he retired and then got a job there at the post office. And then we were just settled in Orlando for at least for all the time I was growing up. Gotcha. I grew up in Tampa. I know. I know about Winter Park. Oh, great! Pretty, pretty good baseball at Winter Park High. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. What Tampa? What, what school did you go to? Uh, Blake High School in Tampa. It kind of it, okay. it was closed and then it reopened in around 1999 type deal. So okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but good times. And let's throw it back. You said you met the uh, the beautiful Miss Tiffany on a bus stop at Duke. You remember the game yeah. you spit to her to? to you know, I, you know, it's kind of interesting. So she, um, she really talked to me. I didn't really, um, really talk very much, actually. You know, I went to the bus stop. I was waiting there to catch the bus. Um, we had met each other going up to one of our uh, mutual friends' house. So one of my good friends was a roommate with one of her good friends. And so we had passed. We'd seen each other in passing. I actually didn't remember it. Um, she did. was talking to me. Then one of my friends came up with a car. And I got in and, and ended up leaving. So, but it was kind of like new car syndrome at that point. So then it kind of, then I felt like I started seeing her everywhere. Realized she lived, her apartment was about a block away from ours, right in front of the bus stop. And so then I started getting off the bus, going by her apartment. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, and then eventually, but at the time we were dating other people. And so we were just kind of friends and then it kind of, um, yeah, it kind of blossomed. Now I always tell the story publicly that, you know, she stalked me, but that's mm -hmm. not completely true, but, um, <laughs> but that's usually the way, um, that's usually why I say it. Yeah, you were busy then too, though, played a little, little football as well. Tell me about your college football experience at Duke. You know what, it was tremendous, you know, I wasn't necessarily a great player, didn't play a lot, was really like a role player, um, played on lots of special teams and, and that kind of deal, but I enjoyed it, you know, some of my closest um, relationships are my teammates, and um, actually one of our student trainers who I'm still close to. And, and so it, it was unbelievable. I mean, we didn't win a lot of games. And so Steve Spurrier's first year at Florida was my first year at Duke. Mm. So Coach Spurrier and that staff recruited us. And then, um, and then after the um, All-American Bowl, so Duke played Texas Tech in the All-American Bowl, that staff left and went to Florida. And, um, and then his top assistant, Barry Wilson, kind of got the head Duke job, and, and that's who our coach was. So we just missed Coach Spurrier. Um, but I played with his son, Stevie Jr., um, and, um, and it was great. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. It was a tremendous experience. Now you played some running back, correct? I was a running back, yeah. So, but unfortunately, too slow, not explosive enough. And so that's why I'm 
and that's why I'm an administrator now. I didn't want to say nothing, man. I, I I looked up the stats, and I mean, touches were low. I saw no touchdowns, man. I'm sure in high school you were fairly dominant, and then you get there, and now I'm not getting touches or even scoring. What's up with that? I know, you know. I mean, I just wasn't good enough, you know. I mean, <laughs> so I mean, in my own mind, I probably was uh was better than um than certainly I was in in real life. So no, you know, I, I didn't I didn't play a ton, and um so, but I you know I'm okay with that. I mean, that's that's kind of how it works. And, um, it was a good experience. You know, I got a chance to let her four years and, um, yeah, and I wouldn't change my experience there. It was pretty tremendous. And, and obviously I got a great education. I always say that, um, yeah, you know, one of the best things that happened to me was going to Duke, you know, I put my family number one and then, um, you know, and then going to Duke is probably right there besides my family. Uh, one of the best things that has happened to me. So you graduate from Duke, which is obviously a phenomenal degree to get, and then you sort of look like you aimed right into your goals of administration. Talk to me about your game plan after that undergraduate degree. Yeah, you know, I, I was pretty lucky. You know, I mean, I would always, I always counsel student athletes to go talk to their academic advisor. You know, because that's really how I got my start. I went to see Dr. Kennedy, who was our academic advisor, um, athletic academic advisor. And I was kind of like, you know, all right, what am I going to do when I graduate? He was kind of like, what do you want to do? I was like, I really don't know. He started asking me a bunch of questions. <laughs> and then he was kind of like, hey, well, why don't you do what I do? And I was kind of like, well, what do you do? And he explained it to me. And that was really the first time I had an understanding there was all this infrastructure that went on to allow us to play our football games. And, um, and all the people that were able to make a living – through intercollegiate athletics. And so he gave me an application for an NCAA internship and I ended up getting selected for that internship. And that's how I got started. So I feel like I'm pretty lucky in that I really was able to hone in on something that I was really passionate about right out of undergraduate. And, um, you know, and, and, and I don't think most people get a chance to, to get started that quickly. So I feel like I'm very lucky in that regard. Great experience from there, working with the NCAA, Vanderbilt, NCAA again, and then you land at Oklahoma. You, you land there as your senior associate athletics director and then decide to get your master's degree at that time. What was the thinking behind that? Yeah, you know, I thought I would need a master's degree to, um, you know, to just, you know, one of my mentors would always tell me, hey, the one thing about um, selection processes and hiring process is at the beginning, they're just looking for ways to disqualify you, you know, because there's just so many people competing for those jobs. And he's like, so your goal is to make sure you check enough boxes so you don't get disqualified in that first kind of um, first kind of review. And I thought having a master's degree, if you're going to work in higher education, would be something that would help make sure I didn't get, you know, um, selected out of the process um, because of a lack of education or um, or an advanced degree. And so, so I always knew that I wanted to do it. I just needed to find like the right kind of environment and the right, um, kind of opportunity. And Oklahoma was that place, you know, it was, a it was a great school. They had a lot of flexibility in terms of how classes were structured, which I was able to fit kind of around my schedule. And, um, and, and so, and my boss, you know, was really, um, supportive. I talked to him about that during the hiring process. Hey, something I want to do. I feel like I need to get my master's. And one of the reasons I went to Oklahoma is because I wanted to be um, an athletic director. And and so working for Joe Castiglione, I thought would be a great opportunity to learn from one of the best ADs in the business. And so, you know, I was open with him and, and he encouraged me to get my master's and, and really helped me. And so he created like an environment that was supportive and um, and allowed me to get that degree while I worked at Oklahoma. Fresh off of that, you get the call by American University to become their AD of athletics and recreation. The big time finally hits. What was that feeling like? You know, it was great. You know, one of the things, so Tiffany really wanted to live in Washington, D.C. Hmm. So the, the, so getting, going to America was like perfect because it was a great academic school. Obviously it was in Washington, D.C. I didn't know it at the time, but I worked for one of the best people that I know I'll ever work for. He was unbelievable, Dr. Kerwin there. And so, and, and the one good thing is I was able to learn, you know, certainly, you know, made my mistakes being a first time AD and, and trying to figure it out. But, you know, I did a little bit under the radar um, without, you know, necessarily the bright lights that were um, shining on me. And so I think I was able to allow to, um, yeah, just grow and develop in, in a really good way with a supportive boss who was just terrific. 
um, a great academic university and, um, and, and certainly a place that Tiffany wanted to live. So it was, uh, it was, it was perfect. I mean, I loved, I loved my time in American and, and, um, and think fondly of American and, um, and, and all the people I worked with there. You take that experience and then you join probably one of the most underrated fan bases in the country, the spiders of Richmond. Um, what was that experience like four years there? Yeah, you know, I loved Richmond. You know, it was great. You know, um, one of the reasons I went to Richmond was because of football. So I wanted to be involved with football. Obviously, you know, we just talked about that earlier. And 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 this this kind of piece that, you know, I played football. I love football. It's my favorite sport. Um, and I love going to practice. I love everything about it. And so um, having the opportunity to work with a football program at Richmond was what was really exciting. Also another great academic um, institution I had another unbelievable boss there, and Ed Ayers, um, who was tremendous, and a lot of great colleagues. And, um, and so my time there um, was great, and it also gave me a great appreciation for FCS football, the quality of FCS football, um, you know, what they're trying to do, and, and obviously, you know, that kind of championship structure. So I thought my time at Richmond was tremendous, and, um, and it's an incredible institution, and I, I, yeah, it was, it was great. It was terrific. After your four years there, Executive Associate Commissioner for the A-10 Conference, what made you decide to take the leap out of the day-to-day collegiate athletics for a university into a uh, big office role? Yeah, you know, you know, going to the conference office is a little bit of a, of, a, of a shift. Part of that was necessitated by, you know, trying to get back to D.C. And um, so certainly my partner Tiffany had some health challenges that wanted to get back and and support her. But also, you know, I had worked with Bernadette uh, McGlade for a really long time, and she just a really tremendous, tremendous person and thought she could give me some insight and thought maybe, you know, the conference office would be a good, um, yeah, a good place for me. You know, having worked at the NCAA, having been an AD, you know, I could take those experiences and put them together and, and, and kind of have the best of both worlds in terms of, of a conference office, which is kind of understanding what's going on on campus, understanding what ADs and presidents are going through, having lived that for 10 years as an AD, but also understanding kind of the NCA processes, the governance process, you know, kind of how you manage a bureaucracy, having my time at NCAA. So combining those things together, I think um, really yeah, I, I thought made a conference office a, 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 a kind of a natural next step. Natural next step. Obviously, you go from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. Um, you, uh, uh, Tiffany, probably not the happiest leaving Washington, D.C., but you got to do what you got to do. Um, just over a year ago today, you uh, become the uh, first African-American commissioner of the NCAA FBS conference, named the commissioner of the uh, Sun Belt. What does that mean to you? Yeah, you know, it was it was it was pretty incredible. So the um, you know, I didn't I don't know that I really realized I was a first um, black FBS commissioner until someone asked me that question. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm the first black SBF commissioner. That's great. You know, when I think about those things, I really think about my parents. You know, I mean, my parents grew up in Jim Crow, South Carolina. You know, they're both in their you know early '80s. You know, um, and and so the opportunities that I have or opportunities they did not have. They just couldn't have had those opportunities. And not because they weren't smart enough or talented enough. It was because they just, the doors were closed. And so, and they spent their whole lives trying to make sure that my brother, my sister and myself had doors open for them, you know? And so I really, it really makes me think about them. You know, I I kind of try to make choices that make them proud just because I know all the things that they've gone through to try to give me these opportunities, whether it's going to Duke or being an athletic director or being a commissioner. And, um, and so I I just feel like I owe them um, a debt of gratitude that I can never pay back. And the only way that I can pay it back is by honoring them and, um, and honoring their memory. And so that's why I really, that's what I really thought of. I was kind of like, you know, this is really about my mom. My mom's like the hardest worker, most organized, smartest person I know. And, um, you know, and it's an opportunity she would have never had. So, so I, I, it, it makes me think about them. I, I, I'm excited for them and excited for everything that they invested in me and, and just hope that, you know, the choices that I'm making are, are making them proud in, in, in some way. Do you feel some sort of burden to succeed in a position like this? 
you know, I don't know. I wouldn't call it a burden. You know, I feel like it's a responsibility, you know, certainly, you know, I think about myself growing up and, um, and all the people that I've had mentors in my life and particularly, you know, people of color. So I've had great mentors, you know, of all different races. And, and so, and, and I thank them, but when I think about, you know, having someone that looks like you, having someone who is um, another, you know, person of color that kind of understands kind of um, what, what kind of your life experience is, it, it means something. So thinking about some of the folks in my life, whether it's my first mentor, Rochelle Collins, or my first boss, Stan Johnson, and, and what they did, or when I went to my first NCA convention, and I saw Charles Harris, who was the AD of um, Arizona State at the time, or I saw Gene Smith, who I think at the time might have been the AD at Eastern Michigan. Now he's AD at Ohio State. And I think about all the people of color, Alfreda Goff, and who who were just role models to me, who I would watch. And I would just be like, one of these days, I hope I get to do what they do. And, um, and so, so I understand that for people who are coming up, you know, I serve that, that same role, you know, for them. And those folks are still serving that role for me. I look at Gene Smith every day and I'm just like, that guy's amazing. I hope one of these days I can be as good an administrator as he is, you know? Um, and, um, and so, you know, so just trying to understand that. That's why, like, if people reach out to me, I take every call. Mm-hmm. I try to give them the best advice I can in terms of, you know, how you get started in the business or should you do A, B, or C and, um, and try to make myself available. Because I really, I don't think about it as a burden. I think about it, one, as an honor, and two, that I have a responsibility to give back to um, uh, an enterprise and a group of people who have given so much to me and, and certainly – you know, I, I stand on their shoulders. I certainly didn't get here alone. And, and so I know what it takes and I just try to help others, you know, follow that same path if that's something they're interested in. When you took that, that opportunity um, where you mentally prepared for what you were about to see, now you're in the big seat. Now everybody's looking at you. You're the final answer. Were you mentally prepared for those first couple of months? You know, it's interesting. So when I left Oklahoma, I said to my boss, I was like, hey, now I get to see if all the advice I gave you that you didn't take works, you know, and, and that's the way I kind of think of it. I mean, I think the reality is leadership is lonely. You know, I always think about, you know, I always think Michael Jordan is a great example because no one sees the thousand shots he takes a day and just all the work that goes into being Michael Jordan. You think he just shows up, drops 56 on the Knicks, and goes about his business because he's some sort of unbelievable person. And, and, and certainly he is unbelievable and is a great person, but the tenacity, the work, and the commitment, and I think leadership is the same way, you know? I mean, I, I think leadership is, is lonely, you know, at the end of the day. Um, you know, when things are going well, you know, everyone's there trying to take the credit. When things aren't going well, you're standing there all by yourself trying to explain to people why it didn't work. And, um, and so, and I, and I think that's more acute in today's culture where, you know, every mistake is some sort of, you know, referendum on how ridiculous uh, decision making you are when it's just like, Hey, at the time, this was a set of facts and I made the best decision possible. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. So I do think leadership is lonely and, um, and at times can be hard. I think I'm really fortunate in the Sun Belt because I've got great um, ADs and great leadership. And Brian Maggard is the chair of our AD group, who's obviously the AD at Louisiana. And in our CEOs, I've got great leadership there. And the chair of our CEO group is um, Joe Savoy. So, um, so we've got really good leadership. They're really supportive. They give me good ideas. You know, I try to create an environment where people feel like they can be honest with me. So that way I can get you know, hear the bad and the good, which helps us make good and informed decisions. So, um, so yeah, you know, I, I feel like I was ready for it in a sense of, um, you know, I kind of understood what leadership was. I don't know if I was ready for it in the sense of knowing how to make all the right decisions. And, and over time, you kind of figure out, you know, how to make choices, how to evaluate things better and better and, and, and you become a better decision maker um, over time with experience. One year in, you didn't even complete your first full year, yeah. and you're hit with the coronavirus. And uh, speaking of decision making and those great CEOs and ADs that you work with, you're put in a position where you had to tell them that the courts are going to have to empty, 
the fields are going to have to empty and you're canceling all spring sports. What was that feeling like and what went into making that decision? Yeah, you know, what I would say it was super hard, you know, and I wish I could be a little more eloquent than that, but, you know, that really sums it. It was just really, really hard. You know, having been a student athlete, I know how important it is to play. And so thinking about canceling a conference championship, um, particularly a basketball championship, we were in the middle of it. We'd yeah. gotten to the semifinal round of the basketball championship, and then you're going to end up canceling it. So, so I think that, that, that it was, that's one of the harder things um, that I've had to do or had to work through professionally. I thought our ADs and CEOs were great. You know, I mean, they actually – knew that's where we were headed. Um, you know, I, I think the interesting thing is just how fast everything kind of um, kind of transpired over like a 36 hour period where, you know, you start thinking, okay, the hardest decision you're going to have to make is to not play your championship in front of fans to canceling it, you know? And, and, um, and so, and, and that all happens in about, you know, 24 hour period as you see how things change as the recommendations for the public health officials change. And, um, and so I, I thought our CEOs were great. You know, they got it. Now, the fortunate thing is they were all dealing with it on their campus. And, um, and the same with the ADs, you know, there were things changed on their campus. They were closing dorms. They were doing all types of things. So I think at some point the decision almost got to where it was inevitable, um, you know, where, where you could see where it was headed, where, you know, a week before you didn't think any, there was any way that could happen. And then all of a sudden, the data changes and shifted shifts in such a way that um, there's only one decision you can make. Personally, be, obviously we know a lot more now than we did then, but personally at that time, did you feel like we were possibly jumping the gun on making such a brash decision? You know, I didn't feel like we were jumping the gun, but I, I don't know that I knew the gravity of, of, of the situation, you know, and, and part of the reason I didn't, jump the gun is I, I do know what I don't know. And I'm not an epidemiologist, you know? And so you've got these people who've studied and have all this experience, whether it's Dr. Fauci or Dr. Bricks, and you're just kind of like, all right, they, they know what they're doing. They're saying these things, but I can honestly say, I don't know that I understood it all, you know? And, and so, um, and that's one of the reasons we kind of started our own, you know, kind of a Sunbelt COVID-19 advisory panel was so that we could, have people who really understand the science help us make better policy decisions, you know, because it really is a acknowledgement of, Hey, these are things we don't know, you know, which, um, which is important to understand that. And that's, that's where I say I was, I wasn't, I almost didn't know enough to think one way or the other, whether it was too fast or, or, or not fast enough because I just didn't understand it. And um, now looking back, you know, based on what I know now, I would argue, you know, we probably should have shut all this down like, you know, two months ago, right, right. you know, um, and, um, and, and so because now we're trying to hopefully get this under control so that we can have a football season. And a one football of the big, season. for sure. And one of the, the bigger conversations as well coming off this spring is, hey, baseball, softball players, tennis players, golf, track, indoor and outdoor. These guys were in their season still. Um, seniors. Uh, right. Where are we at? I know we had a vote, uh, but if you could kind of just review where we are with that situation and what that looks like for, for seniors next year. Yeah. So in the spring sports, you know, the NCA voted to um, um, give them an additional year of eligibility and also for one year give um, institutions the opportunity to exceed their team limits in those sports to bring those seniors back. So they really did pave the way for institutions to bring um, those students back. So they have an opportunity to have a, a, a full and complete um, final season if they so choose. And, um, and so now I think institutions are kind of working through the mechanics of that, which is, you know, how many of those students want to come back? Um, because one of the things that's challenging for them is, those are equivalency sports, you know, so, um, or at least in most cases. And, and so, and so that means that those kids are probably going to have to pay some more money themselves um, in that regard. And so whether, you know, whether they make that choice or not, and the institutions got to also figure out 
you know, where some of that money's going to come from, because certainly there are some financial headwinds that are um, confronting all of us because of the economic shutdown associated with the public health crisis. And, um, and so I think that there's some, there's some local questions that still need to be answered, which is, you know, how many students actually want to come back and how are those um, institutions going to pay for those, um, pay for that financial aid? And you're leading right into that that follow up, which is, you know, what what possible strains could we see here in the Sun Belt? Because, I mean, you you have schools like Notre Dame or a USC that have huge television contracts that can kind of facilitate monies in different areas if need be. Uh, but the Sun Belt may not necessarily be in that same situation. So if an entire baseball and softball team comes back and they had 15 seniors apiece, how are they um, in terms of paying for the situation if the funds aren't there? Yeah, you know, I mean, and I think every institution is kind of figuring that out. The one thing I would say, though, is I think the the schools that certainly have um, larger budgets are really in the same boat as 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 all the other schools. You know, Sunbelt schools are probably not that different um, than SEC schools in this sense, which is we all had budgets and those budgets are all going to be under stress because, one, we know the NCA distribution is less, so we're getting less – um, than we budgeted from the NCA, but so is, you know, all the Autonomy 5 conferences too. And um, and so we all are finding that we're going to have to fill some of these gaps. You've got um, whether or not, you know, sponsorship money is is going to be hard, much harder to come by um, just because there's going to be less um, capital available in the marketplace for that. So I think that we all got to understand there might be a hit there. I mean, whether or not people are going to have the disposable income to buy tickets and come to games, whether the health situation is going to be such that t- people are allowed to go to games. I mean, you know, so I, I think there are a lot of budgetary impacts that we'll feel across all of division one, um, regardless of the size of our budget, that will be hard. And, um, you know, in the Sun Belt, and I'm assuming like, you know, all the other conference conferences as well, we're working with the ADs to figure out what that looks like and what those changes are and how, our distribution can be, you know, modified in ways to try to tr- try to help mitigate some of those challenges that we know are coming. And I know one of the big money makers across the country, obviously, is football. Um, it's probably one of the scarier thoughts is if this thing goes into the summer, creeps into the fall, um, where does our football go? Asking you if you could put a put your guess on it. Will there be a football season? And if we do have one, what does it look like? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll give you the honest answer, which is I really have no idea. You know, I mean, I I just don't know. So I'm optimistic. I believe and hope that we'll have a football season. You know, one of the things that I would say is if we all follow the advice of the public health professionals and, you know, shelter in place, wash our hands, use the social distancing deals, wear masks, do all those things. Maybe we can get on the other side of this to begin opening our country up so that we can, you know, ensure that we would have a football season. But at the end of the day, if we don't get the public health crisis under control, then we won't have a football season. I mean, you know, it's kind of that simple. And so um, so hopefully, though, there's enough time to do it. It seems like, you know, based on the folks that we're talking to and the things that we hear, if people do what they're asked to do and we can incre- increase the testing protocols, um, that we'll have an opportunity to have a season. But, you know, only time will tell if we're, if we're doing those things and if we can kind of get that curve flattened in a way that we start um, opening up the economy. And then once you open up the economy, then that gives us an opportunity to begin to open our campuses in a way that allows for a football season. But I'm optimistic. We're preparing for a football season. We're preparing for a full football season, but also developing contingencies for a shortened season, a conference-only season, um, but, you know, hopefully by July 1, you know, we're, we're, we're starting something, you know, that, that resembles, you know, some sort of, um, you know, glide into, you know, preseason camps, which for most people are opening or, or scheduled to open around August 5th or 6th. How does a conference only season work on the conference level? And then also do, does the FBS still have a national champion and that sort of deal, a playoff? Yeah, you know, I, I think if we get to a point where we can only get eight games in, you could have a conference only season, and um, and those champions go to the um, to the various conference championships, and that allows 
us to figure out the bowls and the CFP and, and those kinds of things. So I really do think every option is on the table. You know, I mean, we certainly are going to do everything that we can to have a football season. We're not going to jeopardize public health. We're not going to jeopardize the health and safety of our student athletes to do it. But we're hopeful that, um, you know, we can – um, get to a point in this public health crisis where we got it managed, where we can test and isolate in a way that that keeps the um, virus at bay until we um, get us to get a, um, a vaccine or herd immunity or something like that. And, um, and then we can have a season. But everything really is on the table um, so that we can we can try to have, um, you know, a football season and not have it interrupted. And really, that's for all of our fall sports. You know, we want to give those students an opportunity to play and compete and um and and do the things that they love doing into your contingency scenarios how far in advance has your thinking been on if there are no fall sports this year yeah you know what so i I certainly think that's a possibility um you know we don't put it i I don't think about it so much as a content in our in my content in our contingency planning just because it really is kind of catastrophic in terms of the changes that would happen so we just know that you know, at that point, it's, it's um, you know, it's a triage effort if we don't have a football season and a fall sports season um, from a revenue standpoint. So, um, so we don't think about it so much in the contingency plan just because that's just a whole lot of zeros. And, and so, you know, we'll wait till that actually happens because we know that those will be, you know, pretty significant um, declines in revenue that um, we kind of understand what that modeling means. That model means that, you know, that we really are going to be in a, in a tremendous, tremendous crisis, um, you know, of, of tremendous proportions from a financial standpoint. And, um, and so we kind of we kind of understand what that looks like. That'll be that'll be really hard um, yeah. if, we, if we don't have a fall sports season. Conference office, you're the head of it. What uh, things have been put in place to protect your staff, everybody working remotely? What are some of the things you guys doing? Yeah, everyone's working remotely. So we, um, we're having conference calls really twice a week based on functional areas to try to stay connected. Um, trying to focus on, you know, the communication side, just creating content and, and getting ready. You know, the, the one upside, if there is such a thing in something like this, is that it does allow us to focus on some things that we wanted to do that we didn't necessarily have the time to do. So, and that's, that's really, um, you know, and that's positive. So we're trying to take advantage of that time and, um, and um, and stay and stay connected. So we've been working remotely, which is actually, you know, it's been good. I mean, I, I certainly miss being around the staff. I certainly miss some of the convenience of getting an idea and just popping into someone's office, someone's office, or them just coming in and being like, "Hey, what do you think about that?" Um, everything now is so it takes so much more time because you almost got to schedule a call, or you call them, and got to talk to them, or you got to send a really long email. And so I think that there there are some efficiencies from it. But I think there's also some inefficiencies as well in terms of, of how we work. But, you know, I'm adjusting to it. And I mean, I'm really kind of a – I really like to sit in front of people. I like to talk. I like to go in people's office. And, um, and so for me, this is um, – you know, I'm getting a little stir crazy in that regard. But, you know, but I just try to take it day by day and, 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 and make it work. You're obviously living in one of the hardest hit areas in not only the state, obviously, but in the country, in New Orleans. Uh, what's the feeling like there? Um, how are you going about your day to day as far as grocery shopping and that sort of deal? Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm, I've been going kind of once a week to go kind of pick up things to trying to limit my self going outside. I mean, I really do just want to give, uh, um, you know, personal thanks to all the first responders, all the medical personnel that are working so hard to keep um, people safe and, um, and protect the community. And I feel like, you know, my responsibility to them is to stay home. You know, and, and to make sure that I'm doing everything in my power to stay away from the virus. So that's what we're doing. You know, probably cooked a lot of cooked a lot more over the last two weeks than I have in a while, which here in New Orleans is probably a good thing because the food oh. is unbelievable <laughs> and it's so good. But it always starts with about a stick of butter. And so always, just always. You know, so, I, so that actually may make me a little healthy. And my aorta is probably pleased that um, I'm cutting down some of that saturated fat. But, um, but yeah, so we've been, but I try to go on a walk early in the morning when, you know, most people aren't out trying to keep my social distance. And, and then from there, there, I just kind of stay in and move from room to room to try to get a little bit of a different, different kind of scenery and a different look. But, um, 
But, you know, I really just think about it as, you know, it's a sacrifice that we need to make to make sure that we are doing our part to keep the public as safe as possible. And, um, and so, and, and like I said, I'm hopeful that if we do this, we can get on, on the other side of this, you know, sooner rather than later and, um, and begin to get, you know, kind of life back to normal. Where are you at to, uh, to break the monotony? What are your hobbies? Are you watching TV? Are you listening to music? What are your go-tos now? You know what? It's a little bit of everything. So I'm in the, so I read the Washington post every day. So I've, I've probably done that for, yeah, you had to throw that out there like I'm supposed to believe that. But, yep, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yes, yeah, so I still read the Post. I'm reading a book right now. So I'm reading Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. So okay. I'm getting ready so I can go see the film. Um, so I'm reading that. I, the great thing about the Rewind is so yesterday I watched the, um, the um, Duke Butler um, 2010 mm-hmm. National Championship game. I um, – I taped the Duke Wisconsin 2015 national championship game, which I watched later last weekend. I watched the 92 Kentucky, um, the Kentucky Duke um, regional um, semifinal or regional final. Uh, So, you know, so I've been doing some of the, you know, Duke basketball greatest moments rewind, which is, which has been um, fun as well. Um, So yeah, so a little TV, um, a little newspaper, a little book, and then, you know, just trying to, trying to work and, and, um, and, and keep things moving, um, um, from a, from a Sunbelt standpoint. You're a big basketball guy. Who was going to win? Who was going to win your men's basketball tournament in the Sunbelt? Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's really uh, interesting. I thought I had so. you. <laughs> I know, you know, I mean, but you think about it, it's, it's really interesting because you had, you know, the top two seeds get the buy. And so um, Little Rock had unbelievable season, um, played great, clearly kind of was the best team over that course. South had won, I think, eight or nine in a row to get into the second spot. Yep. So they got really hot, you know, but then they were going to be off. You know, both of those two teams were going to be off for like 12 days before they played. You had Georgia Southern that looked really good. I was at their game against um, Georgia State, so they seemed hot. And then Texas State was playing great. So it was going to be – I was really excited. It was going to be a really <laughs> interesting tournament where, you know, you have the best team in the regular season, the hottest team in the regular season, and then you had two teams that were kind of hot coming into the tournament that were going to be playing two teams that had taken 12 days off. You know, and so it was yeah. going to be – there were a lot of really fun kind of storylines that I would have liked to see play out. I thought it would have been a really exciting tournament. Obviously here in New Orleans at, at um, Smoothie King Center – um, so that that really is unfortunately, particularly for those teams that had played so well, played so hard to get to the semis, um, to have the tournament canceled is um, is disappointing. But it would have been exciting. That's all. That that is the one thing I do know. Now on the women's basketball side, the Raging Cajuns ended up knocking off powerhouse Little Rock as well yeah. as that tournament was going. Who'd you have there? Yeah, you know, I mean, in some ways, it, it's kind of the same. You know, you had the, you, you know, Troy yeah. obviously was was really hot and and won the regular season. The Cajuns were hot. I mean, beating Little Rock and um and and kind of moving on in, in that regard. Um, you know, South Alabama had beat UT Arlington, and UT Arlington looked kind of like when I saw them play on March 10th, I was like, oh wow, they're definitely on their way to New Orleans mm-hmm. and then South. South rises up and beat them, you know? And so, you know, and then obviously you got Coastal. Coastal got a player to score 50 points. Come on, you know, DJ. Score 50 points. Yeah. I mean, and so you're just kind of like that. I mean, I, you know, I thought that was going to kind of play out the same way because I, I was really interested in seeing what the 12 days off. I just, you know, because that to me seems like that could be a momentum killer. Like, you know, if you're like South men and you've won, you know, eight or nine games in a row, you want to keep playing. You know, and so, and were that would they be able to capture the magic? So it was. There were got a lot of good storylines, both on the men's and women's side, um, that would have been fun to see play out. Everything's heading to Pensacola next year. Uh, what went down in that making that decision, and um, the uh, the beauty of Pensacola taking over there? Yeah, you know, we're really excited about Pensacola. We we're just trying to find a city that was really interested in having our um, tournament, that really wanted our tournament. We wanted to find an arena that we thought was um, was a good kind of fit for our tournament and then a potential destination for our fans. And one of the great things about Pensacola is, you know, that's where a lot of the Sunbelt fans vacation, you know, and that kind of Gulf Coast, you know, probably 
from, you know, Destin to Orange Beach, you know, from, you know, Florida, Alabama. So um, it really was a perfect kind of location, I think, for our fans. Um, it was a good opportunity for a lot of our schools will be able to drive there. Um, so there's some, there's some proximity to it as well. And, um, and it was a town that was really interested in having our tournament. And, um, and so, you know, having that kind of partnership and, and kind of um, connectivity with a town, I think, will really help us to continue to grow our tournament and, and make it better. Being right on the water doesn't hurt either. Gorgeous location. No, it doesn't. Let's go. Yeah. Some really good views. And uh, sure. one of the times I was down there, I found some good barbecue too. So Come on. And you can never go wrong <laughs> if you can find some good barbecue. We'll end on this. You got 15 seconds to give a message uh, from folks that may not have heard from you in a little bit, but you can speak to all the ADs, student athletes, and students going through this tough time. What would you say to them? You know, I would say to them, follow the recommendation of the public health um, officials, and um, we can get through this together. You know, obviously, you know, the United States is an um, unbelievable country, and we have done unbelievable things in very tough times. This is another one, but we'll get through it together, and, um, and um, better times are, are, are certainly ahead. Commissioner of the Sunbelt Conference, Keith Gill, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Take care and be safe. You too. Special thanks to our sponsor for the Raging Cajuns podcast. The golf season has arrived. And if you're looking to shave strokes off your game, you've got to visit the golfballs.com retail center. New inventory is arriving daily. Check out the newest clubs from Ping, TaylorMade, and Callaway. The latest balls from Titleist, Bridgestone, and Srixon. Or the hottest apparel and shoes from Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour. Located in the Boulevard Shopping Center on Arnold Boulevard next to Harbor Freight Tools. Golfballs.com. We're in your bag.